Podcast. Pod, podcast. 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 Yeah, welcome to the Racer X Exhaust Podcast. I am Jason Wygant. Again, I did sing the theme song live. I just didn't have my camera turned on. I want to thank Yoshimura. They were a longtime title sponsor of the Exhaust Podcast. I'm Jason Wygant. They have exhaust systems that are dialed in, whether you ride a street bike or a motocross bike or an off-road bike, even an ATV. They got some really cool systems recently for some new street bikes like the awesome already sounding in stock form and even better if you have a Yoshimura exhaust, the Yamaha MT-09, the triple Yamaha street bike. If you have a Yamaha dirt bike, we've talked quite a bit about how the YZ450F system gives a more rideable, broader, more manageable spread of power. If you have a KX450 from Kawasaki, you have big, big gains in peak power. And of course, if you have a Honda or a Suzuki well, they were involved with the factory efforts for those programs for a long time. So absolutely, they got the exhaust system for you. And they do, of course, have uh, exhaust systems for KTMs, Husqvarna's, and Gas Gas also. So go to Yoshimura-RD.com and also check out Yoshimura Cycling for the Chaleo pedal, which I have recently installed on my own mountain bike because it's summertime and I'm trying to become a mountain biker again. That'll last for about 10 days, but the pedals are awesome. Also, this podcast brought to you by Just Live CBD products because of the mountain biking, the knees, the aches and pains, all of that. I've been using the balm or cream. It definitely helps reduce inflammation and pain. Just Live. Dot com just live.com for their CBD products was developed by athletes such as Travis Pastrana, who has certainly had his share of injuries through the years, and also NBA superstar Clay Thompson, who has certainly had his share of injuries through the years, and it helped them get through their day. Uh, athletes founded this company to help them with their everyday aches and pains. So if it works for them, you know it works for you, and you can get a discount. Let me look it up here. Yes, if you go to justlive.com. Uh, we will give you 30% off. Enter RacerX, all lowercase, one word, RacerX at checkout. Justlive.com. Use the code RacerX and we'll give you 30% off your justlive.com order. CBD products, less stress, sleep better, less pain. It could change your life. Also brought to you by Cardo Systems, the world's leader for trackside communications. Whether you're on the tracks, trails, or the road, Cardo Systems industry-leading mesh technology keeps you and your fellow riders connected for up to one mile. That's why riders like Ricky Carmichael rely on Cardo Systems for street riding entertainment, as well as a training tool at the track. It is becoming quite popular now for coaches to work with their riders using a Cardo Systems communicator pack because you can tell the rider what he's doing without the rider having to stop. I'm going to try this with my kid at the track. Stand up and ride on the balls of your feet. I can say that. I can yell at him now through Ricardo Systems, or I can speak you know, very nicely because it is my child. We'll also give you 15% off. Type in RX15 at checkout at cardosystems.com. RX15, capital R, capital X15. At Cardo Systems for more, all Cardo Pack Talk communicators are fully waterproof, dirtproof, and feature sound by JBL. And also Onyx Maps have been with us for a while. Nowhere to go with access to over 500,000 miles of trails and roads, open dates and public lands. Zoom in to find trails and off-road riding areas in all 50 states. Easily view public lands like national parks, BLM, and national forests. And if you're heading out of service, you can download maps for use later. Can't do that when your phone doesn't have service using other apps like Google Maps. We have you covered. Find your zone in the map, download access to trail details, public land boundaries, waypoints. You can also track your location and trips without service. So go to onxmaps.com or onx off-road in the app store. Those are our sponsors. Today, I'm going to get right into it. A awesome conversation with Adam Wheeler, one of, if not the premier journalists in Europe. We talk about a variety of topics. I wanted to talk to him about MXGP, being back in Europe, is it opening up? What's the atmosphere and the industry like there, as opposed to what we've seen in the United States? But then last night, news broke that uh, Feld will no longer use FIM sanctioning for Monster Energy Supercross. It will revert back to AMA-only sanctioning for the future. That happened last night. Wheeler and I had already planned this podcast, but of course, we talked about that topic. 
the real thing I wanted to talk to him about the were the roots for Dylan Ferrandis and Ken Roxon, their early days raised in Europe, racing MXGP, what those guys were like then and what they're like now as they are battling each week, taking the points lead away from each other in Lucas Oil Pro Motocross as we head to Red Bud this weekend. So here is a wide-ranging conversation with one of the most respected journalists in the sport, Adam Wheeler. First of all, I think this is really cool. I would have never even thought about this until we were all forced to get handy with Zoom last year. So you're in Barcelona, and we're just having, I like practically got a tour of your apartment in Barcelona. This is kind of cool <laughs> that we got learned this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm sorry you had to be carried around the apartment. Uh, you probably got some, you know, crop shots as well and all sorts as, as uh, you know, we're moving the laptop around. So apologies for that. But uh, no, it's actually uh, in Barcelona. I don't know if anyone's visited uh, this this country or this city, but it's, um, you know, you hit kind of July, August, and it's really humid and hot. It's not very, very nice. When it gets to September, it's fantastic. We're really in the hot and humid uh, phase at the moment. But um, no, it's good. Uh, you know, we've done a bit of traveling for MotoGP and also for MXGP. Just came back from Atelier Basin, round two of the World Championship. Um, you know, those guys uh, now start a crazy schedule of like six events in seven weeks. Uh, so it's kind of like a nationals uh, calendar. I mean, it seems to be kind of easy for you guys. You've got a couple of breaks here and there. Yeah, it's uh, the races are starting to feel normal, but the schedule absolutely is still like a vestige of making compromises um, earlier in the year. Uh, but we'll see. Here's what happens, Wheeler. I'm going to tell you. So every 10 years, they reinvent. For the, we'll, we'll probably do this for a couple of years now where we have breaks built in. And the riders will be like, oh, this is awesome. We have breaks. We love it. And then someone will say, you know what would be better? When we have weekends off during the season, we can't really relax because we're still in season. We still need to train. We still need to behave. Can you take the breaks away? And then they'll do that for five years. And then they'll be <laughs> like, can you give us breaks? And this is the way it's gone for 30 years now. We'll go back and forth. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, but, but, you know, seriously, for a moment, though, I mean, you know, the, the Supercross is moving away. I mean, the, the ridiculous World Championship tag has been dropped. Yeah. But what, what do you reckon that means overall, apart from some loose guidelines for things like doping? I mean, does, does Feld and the AMA suddenly have a license to go and do a deal with Saudi Arabia? Or, you know, can they head to Australia in a much more orderly or easily fashion? What, what's, what's the scope, do you think? I think it's the opposite of that. And look, it's just you and I guessing here, right? I don't know exactly where this is going. But to me, it kind of puts a fork in that's done. This international expansion that had always been rumored for a long time. Um, I think what has happened more so is we got to batten down the hatches. Like every company was lucky to even survive uh, the last year and a half, not having fans. And it's like expansion going big, doing something crazy. Uh, let's just get back to what used to work and we'll worry about expansion, maybe never or way off in the future. So I think as far as the international expansion thing, I think it's the opposite. There's less of a chance of that happening now. And um, I mean, if I were to guess, I think a big part of it is, as you know, sanctioning fees and having staff is not cheap. And I think certain things that you just didn't mind paying for, maybe they're like, hey, uh, let's just contract right now and just do what we're good at and try to get back on our feet and maybe later. And that's kind of what the FIM press release kind of reflected, at least to me. So kind of interesting there. Yeah, but it's also, there's a little bit of a contrast because they felt like to say they have, was it 113 different countries watching through their TV, their online TV package or their online TV provision. So surely that indicates that the international uh, thirst for Supercross is, is kind of deeper than ever. I mean, I guess there's nothing to stop Fell chasing the big buck if somebody wants to take the series to Saudi Arabia or, you know, the Middle East or whatever. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't, I just wonder if the removal of the FIM barrier is, is going to be, make it easier to do or not. Um, who knows? Yeah. I always thought that that being there made it more likely that was going to happen. I think my assumption, again, I don't know this insider. I think they looked into it. They tried it. They thought about this for years and for whatever reason, they could not make it happen. Probably resistance from the teams is all I could guess. The teams are not pumped ever on this global idea. So I think they tried, 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 looked into it, looked into it. It wasn't working. And it's like, okay, so now we have this world sanction. We're probably never going to go international. Then the pandemic hits and it looks even less likely that you're going to try something crazy. International travel harder than ever. And so I think it's like that. And the side effect is, yes, the, the riders and teams, I think, are hoping that the anti-doping thing gets a little simpler. I don't think that's the main reason that we saw the FIM go away. 
but I think the fighters and teams will take it because they were never obviously pumped on that in the first place. And I, I know we're probably kind of getting away a little bit about what we wanted to talk about on the podcast, mm-hmm. but do you think it's almost a little bit of a backward step in a way? I mean, you think, you know, uh, Supercross now, thanks to stuff like this, like Zoom calls and whatever else. I mean, you can, I can talk to, you know, um, yeah, Plessinger easier than ever, you know, thanks to sort of technology like this post-race. Um, and also the fact that people from, you know, from Guatemala to New Zealand are watching Supercross thanks to an, an online internet, you know, package, uh, you know, to suddenly make, I know it's a very American sport, it's a very American market, um, but there must be international appeal there. I mean, you would think, you know, maybe Feld have to think of it as a global series now or a global product at least. You know, it'd be kind of narrow-minded if they just like say, right, we're going to stick between East Coast and West. Yeah, uh, so that just leads me to think that they must know that that's a bridge they can't cross. I have to imagine that those thoughts have run through their minds. I would not want to say now more than ever, because I guess like doing international events, at least over the next year or two, is going to be pretty hard. But I would imagine three years ago, five years ago, they probably really considered it. And I would think something made them realize, all I can guess is the teams, that's going to be hard to pull off. So we're just going to have to be who we are. Um, but you're right. The appeal probably globally is probably as good as it's ever been or, or bigger. But you know what? Which one of the biggest, um, what's, the, what's the word I could use? One of the biggest kind of uh, no-brainers, if you like, in international moto is why has there not been a round of like formerly world championship supercross, uh, supercross in France? Because if you've been to Bercy or like for the last couple of years, they've done it in a brand new stadium in Paris, mm-hmm. the place is full to the rafters, you know, and that's usually with a couple of token high profile American guests. Um, you know, you might have a couple of guest GP riders there, like Ferran, this has done it in the past, Roman Febra has done it in the past, Gautier Paulin was always a popular draw. Even Tony, Tony Cairoli had a go at it. Um, and it's, 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 it's a big hit. I mean, they fill it for two nights over the weekend. Um, and I imagine if it was like an officially sanctioned AMA round, you know, that's for a promoter anywhere. That's got to be like, uh, you know, a big ka I'm surprised it hasn't happened. Yeah. So, again, this is just my guess, right? Those races have promoters. This series has a promoter. Maybe it wasn't as easy to link those things up. And I cannot stress enough how the teams do not want more races. They badly, badly, badly do not want more races. Now, that that might start to change, right? Because I, a lot of that, honestly, I swear, a lot of it came from Ryan Villapoto got burned out on the sport. And I really think that changed the narrative over here of one of the best riders wanted to retire at the top because he was miserable racing. We have to have fewer races, not more. <laughs> so I think that left a bad taste in everyone's mouth. But that's now six years ago, seven years ago. And then last year, we almost had no races. I think everyone's appetite for racing is maybe more than it was three years ago. So I see what you're saying. We're almost seeing reasons why there could be more races or more international and more interest. But I think they're going the opposite direction. I don't think you're going to see international supercross for a while. And remember, I, Paris is big, I, but they get yeah. like three Americans, not all of them. True, true, true. Yeah. But it's, you know, I think um, from what I've seen so far, not only from sports pr- uh, remotely, but also being on site for the couple that I've been, I think there's going to be a big thirst for people wanting to be back at the fences, um, you know, or in the grandstand seats or whatever. I think that's something we're really going to see. Uh, like a Madley Basin last weekend, um, there was an allocation of 4,000 pre-sale tickets, which were apparently sold out. Um, and to a person, everybody I spoke to about this when at the Grand Prix itself, um, we all thought there was way more than 4,000 people there. I um, mean, it could be the case where there's people hiding in the trunks of cars or in the back of campers and the campsite, you know, the, 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 the numbers kind of um, seem somewhat inflated above the 4,000. Um, I mean, it was a bit of a shame that the UK are, are dealing with a variant of this um, COVID-19 situation, the Delta variant, and it's, um, you know, it's proving far more contagious to the parts of the population that haven't been vaccinated. So for that reason, you know, the UK have put the stops on, on things for a month, um, at least until mid-July, where they were due to remove all restrictions on June the 21st. And of course, the Grand Prix was only just last weekend, which would have given the promoters another week of promotion and sales and whatever else. And I think, you know, on Sunday race day, because MHGP is one in the one, the run, running the one-day format again this year, I think, you know, you would have seen a hell of a crowd there on Sunday. I think, you know, it would have been really difficult to get in the circuit. I believe there's just this... Um, 
this thirst again for people to see like live racing, uh, to appreciate something that they, you know, maybe beforehand thought, well, I'm not going to spend, you know, 60 bucks going to that when I can go to a local race that's down the road for half or even, you know, a quarter of that price. Um, I think, you know, that being taken away should have the smarter, smarter, the smarter sports promoters, you know, working how, how to maximize this thing because um, fans are, are going to want to come back. Oh, absolutely. So the crowds here at these first three uh, pro motocross races here have been nuts. Uh, I've heard like the Colorado race round two was significantly bigger than it was in 2019. You know, the last time they could have a full crowd. Red Bud this weekend is probably going to be absolutely ridiculous because they couldn't really have fans last year. It was kind of like Matterly Basin was last week. They could last year fans could go. You had to race amateur day. If you didn't come in with a dirt bike and you didn't sign up to race amateur you could not be there. So we essentially didn't have fans last year. So yeah, it's going to be nuts. I also want to know this. We also here in the US at least, sales of dirt bikes, sales of mountain bikes and road cycles and pretty much anything outdoors are going nuts. Uh, now we have major supply and demand issues. Is that also happening over in Europe? Yeah, from what I hear as well, it's the same thing. Um, I think, you know, if you're working in the bicycle industry, um, then you're laughing. I mean, well, in one way you are because, uh, you know, the stuff's flying out of the stores and off the shelves. But then, you know, I also hear there's a lot of people worried that they just don't have the product to, to meet yep. the demand, uh, yep. which is another, you know, in business terms, I guess, is another is a big issue. Yep. Um, but you know, it's, uh, yeah, from, from what I, from what I, I mean, a lot of teams, I mean, let's not kid ourselves as well. I think the fallout from the pandemic is still, we still to see the harsh side of it. Um, you know, I mean, I live in Spain and it's a, a, a country that relies heavily on tourism for its, um, you know, its general turnover or it's, uh, GPD or whatever it's called. So, you know, I think the fact that they haven't really been able to have any kind of, um, international travel on, over here is going to hit hard. But, you know, when it comes to the leisure side of it, I think being on a lot of furlough schemes and um, the fact that, you know, it's not similar to the credit crunch like we saw in 2007 and 2008, which really hit racing hard. I mean, I remember kind of how the, the fabric of the paddock pretty much changed um, as brands that, you know, downscaled as much as they could. Um, I, it's a different scenario. Yeah. So I guess really this question is, um, you know, the FI press release even said that the Supercross not renewing their deal was pandemic related. So it's, I'm thinking the problem is that we had to, or, or Feld thought we have to contract, we have to spend less, we have to get rid of some of the major expansion plans that we had to survive this. And you're thinking, well, yeah, that's right now, but three years from now, <laughs> the expansion might be the best thing you could have ever done. I guess that's the bet. Everybody's kind of looking at what we've already been through and they're not sure where we're going. I guess that's the real issue here. Yeah, I think anybody yeah. that depends on ticket money is really, really hurting. I mean, we're not just talking about sports. Mm -hmm. I mean, live entertainment, music business, the arts. I mean, uh, it's oh, yeah. really scary. Uh, so, you know, and I know from in front motor racing, you know, kind of the feld of MXGP, you know, I'm sure. Well, I know for a fact that they're kind of watching every penny. I mean, they have to. I mean, they managed to stage an 18 round series last year, largely behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that doesn't come cheap because as much as they can or, or they don't, okay, there's no prize money and, you know, there's only skeletal help for the teams in terms of freight and travel, but there wasn't that much. I think there was only six countries in 2020 for the GP calendar in total. Uh, you know, they still have their own expenses. I mean, doing a live TV production, having their own staff, I mean, that's, that's, that's a major egg. So, uh, you know, I think to, you know, 2021 is, is going to be another hit. Um, but you just hope that the sponsors, you know, people like, uh, pick a name, uh, fly racing, uh, monster energy, uh, you know, these, these people still investing in the sport. You hope they stay. Yeah. I think you could echo exactly what you said, replace in front with Feld, but there is one major line item that Feld could strike from their budget, which was paying two sanctioning fees. Those are not cheap. You know, the FIM and the AMA, they don't come free. Uh, people probably don't realize how that works, but I know that stuff costs a lot of money. Plus, you essentially have to have double staff. I mean, you literally had yeah. FIM and AMA people doing the exact same job because it was required because they both had to represent. So I think, I think that's what maybe at least, hey, let's think about this. Let's have a conversation about it. And then who knows what else led it down to, to where it is. The FIM PR makes it sound like, hey, maybe they'll come back someday. Uh, I feel like, the taste for the FIM being involved with Supercross, mostly because of the WADA suspensions, is so bad 
that I think it's going to be a big obstacle for them to get back together. And maybe it's not fair to pin the WADA thing and the whole FIM look just on three riders getting suspended, but that's the reputation they have here now. Um, if that sure. didn't happen, people probably wouldn't even care that the FIM was here. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, it makes no difference at all to somebody like Ryan Dungey or Jason Anderson or Cooper Webb that they have to fly to, you know, to Andorra or to Switzerland or to Monte Carlo to, to get, a, you know, an FIM award. I mean, I'm sure that's probably the last thing they have on their agenda come the end of the year. Um, but, you know, yeah. going, going back to what we were saying before, it'll be a really interesting conversation, I think, with one of the business people inside Feld or in front, um, how their business strategy is going to change not only in the short term to cope with how they're managing races to limited public, but then what happens when it all opens up? Because, you know, you have to take a company like Dawn of Sports who have the rights to MotoGP. I mean, they have a different scenario where they can count a lot on TV money income. Um, and, you know, throughout the pandemic and all the restrictions they put into MotoGP, they were still able to facilitate that. In fact, you could argue people depended more on those TV packages than ever before. So, you know, they were still able to pay the teams. They were still able to invest in their structure and their product, um, you know, and when sort of the ticket money does come through again, which, you know, from what I understand is more or less for the circuits anyway, rather than for Adorna because they have their sanctioning fee. Um, you know, it's, it shouldn't change things too much for them. Yeah, Feld, we don't really hear much of the business side from them, but they were adamant that when they ran races without fans last year in Salt Lake, that even in 2020, the media landscape has changed, but their primary revenue is still selling tickets. It's not television money. Sponsor money is obviously great, but the primary revenue is still tickets. So I think if you're them, you're so barely survived, shell-shocked, that you're like, eh, we'll worry about expanding later. We're just trying to keep the company going and, uh, you know, I'm going to get in trouble if I start praising promoters too much, but they did run a series <laughs> this year. They paid purse money. Uh, last year, they had a 20% cut, but this year it was back to normal. They're not going to get credit for that, but, I mean, they kept it going. You could barely tell the difference at the races. I'm sure there were budget cuts you couldn't see. I, uh, maybe minor things. We were wondering about, is there less dirt in the stadium? Things like that. But, <laughs> I mean, for the most part, you were going to a Supercross. Dude, when they had these Tuesday races, Wheeler, I mean, it looked like there were 800 people in the building. I I'm sure it was more, but in these giant stadiums, the crowd on these Tuesday races felt so small. And I'm like, the opening ceremony still had fireworks, still had videos. It looked 95% the same. So I, I want to give them credit. Yeah. People are going to say I'm a shill now. So there you go. <laughs> no, but that's, that's, that comes at a cost, you know? Yeah. And, you know, the biggest shame of it is that, you know, um, people just assume that the sports stay the same all the time. But these promoters are thinking of new ways and new things to get people either watching through TV or getting them to enjoy themselves more in the stadiums, whether that's, I don't know, trying to run a GPS signal. I mean, we saw a couple of years ago guys running, you know, kind of Apple iWatches on their bikes so you could see their heart rates mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, you know, using things like, uh, you know, Lit Pro to, to, to give that information to, to the public. I mean, all that kind of like uh, future or innovation coming up in the entertainment package has probably been put on ice because, you know, they just have to freeze the investment or the money or the budgets or whatever to make it happen. So that's a bit of a shame. Yeah, the unfair comparison that always happens is it's so easy to look at, you know, the MotoGP package is so well done. The television package is so good. All that data, the onboards, all these things. And um, especially when you go to the road racing side here in the U.S., that's really, really, really hurting. It's like they just have way more money. It's just more popular. They have more revenue. They can do more things. Literally, it's that simple sometimes. It's just budget. MotoGP is huge. They have more budget. Their show is better. That's it. <laughs> Yeah, but, uh, you know, the thing with MotoGP is that good now that actually within media circles, there's some people concerned about it because they're becoming a, like a publishing or entertainment uh, hub or whatever you want to call it in themselves. Okay. I mean, I, I was the second English guy to join Dorna on a full time basis, um, you know, in 2001. Um, you know, and now I, I, from what I understand, there's a team of like 15 people who are looking after social media channels, content, video, uh, all sorts of things. And if you go to the official website, you're not just looking at results and sort of um, puff pieces of uh, promotion stories. There's there's rumors there. There's some real investigative kind of material there. They're doing a lot of technical explanations for people who know a lot about the sport or people who are brand new to the sport. I mean, it's all encompassing. And I think, you know, there, there is almost a paranoia amongst external media 
that uh, you know the donor are sort of pumping all this energy and all this um, will into their own publishing empire that it's you know to the detriment of everybody else. So there's a little bit of a strange standoff going off uh, happening in the sport at the moment. Um, you know, because if you are trying to get as many viewers to your own social media and your own website as possible, why do you have to facilitate and help people with their own? So it's a, it's a strange scenario. Yeah, that makes sense. So they're doing what on paper would be the right thing, which is, hey, we're just trying to expose the sport, give the fans the most info, tell them how great our athletes and our equipment is. We're just promoting it. You know, we're trying to make the sport better. And by the way, Formula One in the United States has had this massive, massive boost because they put this series on Netflix. And now people that over the last 50 years could not possibly care less about Formula One are now into it. And then they made a move. They put it on ESPN, which people thought was terrible because ESPN doesn't really care about motorsports anymore. But it's still our biggest sports channel. And the ratings are better than they've maybe ever been. So F1 is having like a bit of a moment in the US because they are now owned by a media company. So yeah. On paper, that's the right thing to do, right? But I, I see the downside where eventually your only media could potentially be the series itself, which obviously people probably want a third party, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And I think, you know, you, it might be something so small, like it's such a small detail, but I think people should be slightly worried because if only somebody like Fox News or whoever or followers of Biden only get access to presidential press conferences, then you're only ever going to hear one side of the story. So, you know, if you're constantly seeing updates from MotoGP through a MotoGP channel or a MotoGP uh, employed reporter or, you know, whatever, then you're only really going to get kind of one side or the side that they're presented. And it's MotoGP. It's, it's, a, it's a minor, it's a niche motorsport in the bigger scheme of things. But if this thing becomes a tendency across society, then, you know, it's, it's uh, again, it's changing media the way, the way that we know it. I think um, it's a little safer on the motocross side because I feel like it's never been a sport that's really defined too much by like referees making calls. Um, and I know fans are going to be like, well, there was Chad Reed got black flag once and James Stewart got suspended for PEDs. Dude, that's like two things ever. You know, when you watch <laughs> MotoGP, they're making track marker violation decisions constantly. And I, I know when you get to those really tight classes like Moto3, I mean, there are decisions made by the race stewards that affect the results weekly. So I guess that's where you're going to kind of see the difference, right? Will there be criticism of their calls or not? if the majority of the media is coming from the series. I don't think it's as much of a dirt bike problem because we don't really have that as like tied into the sports yeah. results as much. There's a, there's a high level of scrutiny at the moment in MotoGP. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's almost fast already because um, you know the, the race finishes and then you have to wait for the penalties or the sanctions and then the order yes. might change. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, for me, the Nadia was um, a Mugello for the Italian Grand Prix recently where Miguel Oliveira, Red Bull KTM's rider, finished second, just ahead of Juan Mir, the world champion on the Suzuki in third. Um, both of them ran slightly wide on the last lap. So the position change was, uh, the position order was changed. So Mir was suddenly runner up and Oliveira was third, but then it was a judge that Mir had actually run off a little bit as well. So they switched the order back. So, you know, you had this bizarre situation in part Ferme where, you know, they're, they're kind of almost having to swap the numbers around the positions. It was, um, you know, you kind of think it's a sporting contest. I, I really, I and mean, we talked about it on the Paddock Pass podcast recently. I think you just have to have some sort of lenience in this. But then the big question is, why are they putting these penalties in place? Why do they have sensors on, you know, uh, on the track runoff? Um, so even if your your rear wheel, you know, we're talking about a piece of rubber that might be two or three centimeters thick. You know, if that goes off into the green, why are you being penalized? And you know, it's, it's hard to find much of an explanation. I think it's just a recent or modern fad for having to get every call right all the time because there's too much riding on it or, you know, somebody's going to protest and it creates a bigger mess down the line. Or maybe it's just a fault of Valentino Rossi and Mark Marquez for hitting each other in Sepang in 2015 and, and creating, uh, you know, the biggest uh, sort of division amongst the, the largest fan bases in sport ever. So it's, uh, who knows? You can always, if you're a conspiracy theory, you can have a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. So if their move is to say like, hey, we're going to try to make it as fair as possible. We're going to put in sensors. We're going to do penalties. We don't care who it is. If you do this, you're getting penalized. Then you have so many penalties. We're now, yes, I hear this complaint that now the races are being decided like 80% on the track and 20% by race stewards, which drives people nuts. Yeah. But they were just trying to do the right thing. And okay, we're going to really enforce this stuff. You can't win. And I think that's fine if they're able to report all that. And I guess that's the danger here. 
that. Yeah, but also you need you need yeah you need transparency as yeah. well. I mean, I always yep. I often thought that one of the best things was like in the NFL. You know, you had the the umpire or the referee or whatever the you know official name is. I mean, he would literally switch on his mic and tell the whole stadium, yeah. 70, 80,000 people, there's a foul because of this. You know, yeah. and you can't think, well, that's it. You know, I mean, even if the call was right or wrong, he's telling yep. everyone that's what it is and it's done. So you don't really kind of get that, you know, in MotoGP and motorsports yet. But, uh, you know, I mean, there's such parity now, Luigi, in, in, in MotoGP and especially Moto3, where you essentially only have two manufacturers and it's a cost control class when it comes to the technical side. So, you know, you have these vast groups of 12 to 15 riders. I mean, you might as well watch the first two laps, go and, you know, have your breakfast or whatever, and then come back and watch the last two laps because, you know, that, that's, uh, you know, that's the real kind of meat of the race. Yeah, and yeah, right. So then penalties really are a huge factor when guys are separated by the entire field is nine seconds apart. You know what, though? Here's what I think would solve a lot of the media, oh, this series is controlling their own media thing. If they realize, and I think maybe they have, that controversy, although it doesn't sound awesome, actually gets people talking and will embrace yeah. it. Even if we make a call that's not popular, it's got people talking Monday through Friday before the next weekend. If they see it that way, you might be able to get the best of both worlds. But I guess yet to be seen if they, they see criticism as actually a conversation and not just negative. Yeah, but then you put the, what's the word, the, um, the dignity or, you know, the, the validity of the championship on a knife edge. You know, if it's, if it's going to be, you know, get to the point of being ridiculous. Okay, you, you're going to create talking points, you're going to create controversy, but if it's uh, a situation where, you know, it, it's, it's too far, basically. I think yeah. that's the danger with it. Yeah, not again. I don't think luckily on the dirt bike side, it's, it's never been as big a deal, even historically, because even the equipment, we all know that the rider matters probably least or sorry, the, the equipment matters probably least in dirt bikes compared to most motorsports. So even like equipment regulations are never quite as critical. I mean, fans, if they want to pick an excuse, can probably use one. But we're a little lucky on the dirt side that it's not probably ever going to get quite to that level. Um, okay, so we've covered. Do you, um, just, yeah, to yep. just to yep. interrupt you for a second there, you know, like in, in MXGP, is, as people who know that follow the series probably know, we have a prototype rule situation. I mean, the yep. rule book's pretty close, but there are, you know, there's a lot of liberty there. And I think that's, you know, explains why there's been interest from manufacturers over the years. You know, they, they've continued investing in, in MXGP because it's a place where you can, you know, apart from the All Japan Championship, where you're going to see bikes up to a year before they will hit the market. I mean, the real latest stuff. I mean, MXGP was the other place to do it before it came to the US. But, um, you know, when it comes to electronics, there's there's kind of a reluctance amongst even the teams in MXGP to go too far, because once you start opening that book, then you're going to need extra staff, you're going to need extra expertise, you're going to need extra testing, it's, it's going to open up a big thing. But you know, you're going to have to imagine the brands are going to push against it at some point because the OEMs want to have a better function in motorcycle, whether it is the right thing to do or it's going to be the right thing for a budget or a cost point of view. You know, then they're not going to want to have to recycle the same technology over and over. And it's, you know, a fact that, um, you know, in recent years, brands have had to look at stuff like uh, chassis, flex and, and development as the only real route aside from trying to develop a more tractable engine. I mean, it's not really been a great deal of progression there. I think it could end up hurting dirt bike racing, you know, in the long term. But I just wanted to, you know, in the US, if you talk to any of the guys in the pits who say, you know, I wish we had a little bit more open rules or, you know, there was more freedom for some of the technicians to, to experiment and have, uh, you know, better performing motorcycles. Is, is it the case there? Yes, I do hear that from like the technical guys on the teams uh, that they would love to have that. But I don't know if it's just luck that people are able to see like where they're coming from. You have to remember, it's always, are they asking because they think it's best for the series or the sport or the, the, the industry at large? Or are they just, man, we have this one problem that we could win races if the rule book would just let us change it. It's always iffy when you're getting info from people that work for a team. Are they just biased? And they might not even think so. They might think, you know, this would be good for everybody, but really deep down, they're just struggling with one thing. I'll give you a perfect example. I think we all know that in Europe, like the KTM Husqvarna's, I think they have like a longer chassis or a longer swing arm. And for example, right now, Muscan and Webb are struggling mightily in motocross. 
my guess would be they would love to get their hands on that non-production frame that probably Hurlings and Crowley and Prado are using. They can't. So if you're KTM, you'd probably be like, you know, it'd be awesome. You could save us a lot of money if we could use racing as R&D. Maybe let us use that frame. And there might be a point where they're right. It does take R&D money and funds racing, which is good. Or are they just trying to make their riders happy so they can get on the podium next weekend? You have to be careful. They all do say that, but I really wonder where it's coming from. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I just, um, when it comes to the question of development, it's, um, it's a real double-edged sword. Uh, I wonder how, how like, it's, like I said, how much you could really open it up. Um, you know, when it comes to KTM especially, I mean, their motorcycle, of course, has been one of the most dominant, you know, both internationally uh, over the last five years. And, you know, they have a new model coming next year. Yep. Uh, you know, and I think the guys aren't racing with it in, in MXGP yet, but I do wonder as we, as we go into the calendar, if somebody like, take a name, Jorge Prado is, is not within the championship reckoning uh, by the end of the season, whether he's actually going to start running the new 450 in Grand Prix, um, even though the plan, I think, for them is to start already racing with it from, from next season. Um, but yeah, it's, you, know, you have to wonder how that bike is going to look, how it's going to feel, and, and when the US guys are going to get their hands on it. And then one other thing on that topic, uh, a couple of years ago, I was talking to one of the Kawasaki guys about electronics, and he was saying, hey, more electronics would be good. Everyone says that these 450s are so fast. Well, on the road racing side, we've seen how you can make a bike safer and easier to ride for a beginner with electronics. So see, if we had more liberties to use more electronics, it would actually be better for the novice consumer. And I wonder, is that real? Or is that just their excuse to get more electronics so they can win more races at the top level? I don't know how you know that. <laughs> yeah, it's, I think it's that, that has to be an excuse. I mean, surely. If you're, if you're a weekend warrior, you're just going out on your dirt bike. I mean, if you're going to have to get your phone out and navigate an app to you know, really set the bike up to be comfortable with it, I, is that really the way forward? Unless they're making these apps like super easy to use. Yeah, but they're right. I mean, on the sport bike side, uh, they've made these 1,000cc leader bikes significantly safer and more rideable for the average consumer, right? Because you can't even loop them out. You, 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 they won't yeah. even let you. So they're not coming from a completely made up piece of information. Like they've already seen this. I just don't know if it really applies in the same way. That's all. Yeah. If you stand back and you look at it, you're like you're outside of the industry and you have to explain it. It sounds ridiculous. Hey, we have a thousand cc sport bike. And by the way, we're going to throw all this stuff on it so you can actually ride it. Oh, by the way, we've also got in the other half of the, the showroom, we've got a 450, you know, dirt bike. By the way, it's got like all these control systems on it as well. So yeah. you can actually ride it around the track. So, you know, don't worry about the 250. Just take the 450 with all this, this stuff on it. And it'll cost you an extra $2,000. That is a great point where we made bikes so fast that now we'll sell you technology to make it less fast. <laughs> yeah that's kind of where we're at um hey so you wrapped up uh your uh, on track off road this week so this is the most up-to-date ever like you literally just wrapped it so what's what's happening you cover some racing over here but a lot of mxgp and moto gp so give me the latest up to date with what's happening there yeah it's uh goodness we're half well moto gp is halfway through so they've done yeah. nine rounds of 18 um mxgp i mean the calendars are still pretty flexible i mean it seems okay. like there's not a month that goes by without a shuffle of the dates or a cancellation of one round you know um i mean our colleague steve mathis i think he's pretty frustrated because he was planning to visit the swedish grand prix which unfortunately for the second year in a row has been cancelled yep. um but uh yeah so i've just um just put the last issue um you know online i mean i do question i mean we're talking about like changes in media landscape and electronics and stuff, I do question the validity of an online magazine in 2021 and whether that format is already, um, you know, uh, well past its sell-by date, even though the, the product is free. Um, you know, that's that's another issue. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I have a roundup of um, some photography and blogs from MotoGP and MXGP. We tried to have, uh, you know, blogs and texts from people right at the heart of the sport. So um you know, you're too expensive, Jason. I can't hire you to, to write for me, unfortunately. But we do have um, we do have Steve Mathis and, you know, like Anton as well. He's, he's thrown in some words. And some guys from MotoGP really know their stuff. I think, uh, you know, if you want to get a bit of insight or some gossip on, on road racing, then, you know, it's just good to dive in and read the blogs by Neil and David. Um, but the, I think, you know, just I don't want to harp on about it too much. But um, one thing I managed to get to the bottom of this weekend was the uh, 
the subject of whole shot devices, which we know have been around for like 20 years in motocross, but you know, they've really seized upon it for a, ma a mechanical advantage, not an electronic advantage in road racing. Um, since Ducati first um, adopted the motocross concept in 2018, you know, which was done by um, an Italian called Corrado Maddi, who is now still racing. He owns a team um, with his son, Marco, who are filled in Fantic bikes, you know, a small uh, uh, Italian brand. Um, they're actually doing really well in the European Championship. So EMX 250 and 125, they won the round actually in Medley Basin last weekend. Um, so he was the, 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 the godfather of this uh, whole shot device, which was picked up by Michele Rinaldi, amongst others, who used it on Stefan Evitz's 500 um, Yamaha in the 2001 Belgian Grand Prix at Spa-Francorchamps. Um, you know, and after that, it was, you know, the, the thing kind of exploded. Um, it was used everywhere. And then, of course, you know, somebody in Ducati decided, you know, we need to get more downforce. We need to get more traction on the starts. And uh, 2018, they started using it in MotoGP and managed to adapt it and use it on the rear of the motorcycle, like a ride height manipulator. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting how MotoGP, the most technically advanced motorcycle sport on the planet, can still, you know, look around and take influences from, you know, a, a significantly simpler discipline like moto and, um, you know, to find advances. Okay, so that's in the latest on track off road, this whole shot device history thing. Yeah, the origin well, story. Well, that's great because we always heard, we actually did something very rudimentary, not nearly this well researched and raised directs recently. <laughs> I think Chad Reed, because Chad Reed came from the GPs to America at the exact time this was happening, I think he is somewhat credited as bringing this idea over, like, hey, when I was on Yon DeGroote's team in Cowie and NXGP, we did this, why don't you try that? And then Yamaha made one, and they were trying to hide it from everybody. They got phenomenal starts. I think this is back, like, 2003, um, when it was kind of a secret. And then within about six months, everybody had one, including the aftermarket. But I didn't even know the origins going back to Everts and even before that. So there you go. Well, it's actually... Well, it's actually um, a nice story because if Chad Reed is somebody who brought it principally to the US, then Michele Rinaldi's version of the of the facts is that it was used for the first time on the factory Yamaha, at the, like I said, the Belgian Grand Prix in 2001. Now, mm -hmm. Chad was racing in Europe in 2001, and I think that very re same race in Spa was his first podium finish um, on the, in the 250cc category. So he would have seen firsthand like Everts maybe ripping a whole shot or something and you know mm -hmm. if he's got an eagle eye then when he was 18 or wherever it was um you know and then took it away it was a shame he was he only uh did one year of gps and a couple of wild cards a couple you know um uh, was it latvia no was it latvia or madly basin two or three years ago yeah it wasn't good it wasn't good <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't the uh the motocross years had expired unfortunately for chet uh at that point yeah, yeah i don't know if he was Today, Chad would notice that whole shot device within three seconds. I don't know about 18-year-old Chad. Um, he's, yeah. He, he, I, I, my kid rides with his kid because Chad has a track right by my house, and he's got spring forks to replace the air forks on his kid's KTM 85, and he said there are only 10 of these forks in existence, and he got one just for his kid to ride, not even racing, just a local track. And I'm like, that is so Chad right there. You've got <laughs> to get the works, well, custom they... forks on your kid's bike to ride for fun. Which is um, actually one of the things I, I explored in the story as well was how some of the teams were using the rear, you know, the HLS, uh, HSL systems on the rear suspension were locking the rear of the bike, you know, like they do in MotoGP now. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, that kind of went out the window as soon as MHGP started using the metal grill start gates um, because you didn't have the suddenly that lift, you know, you didn't have that kind of inconsistency with going from dirt to briefly to metal to dirt. Um, once it was straight, straight away consistent traction and a lot more grip than they had, then they didn't really need this stuff anymore. So it's interesting to hear, you know, some of the team managers and technicians explaining how that surfaced and disappeared. Ah, yeah. Well, you know, eventually that went away more recently in uh, Supercross. I think JGR had a rear lockdown device eight or 10 years ago. And obviously it must have been amazing because eventually they went away from it. Uh, okay, so we'll, we always post a breaking news link to the latest on track off road. So we're on a Wednesday now. That's pretty much popping up as we speak. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is really interesting what's happened in the US. I want to get your background on it. Right now, we're looking at Dylan Ferrandis and Ken Roxon. At least for the moment, we're only three rounds into a 12 round championship. It could change. But at the moment, it's Roxon and Ferrandis fighting over the points lead. They've won all the races so far overall. For you, someone that saw these guys as young guys uh, before they came to the United States, is it ironic? Is it funny? Is it coincidental? Is it weird to see at the moment these two 
future GP guys who've never really raced each other now locking horns. Is that weird for you to see that or funny or ironic or something like that? <laughs> yeah, it's, um, you know, I'm firstly talking about Ken. I mean, he, when he came up, I remember getting a, um, an email from Davy Coombs saying, um, what is all the hype about this Roxon kid? Because he came to Loretta's and he was smoked. Uh, I think Barcia finished 14, you know, 40 seconds ahead of him or something like that. Yeah. I mean, the, the truth, like I mean, the, yeah. Yep. Yeah. I mean, he, he was dealing with a knee injury or something at the time, but like being okay. 14 years old or whatever it was, but you know, he came into GPs. Um, we could see he was pretty special from his first race. I think uh, he took a seventh and a fourth. Um, you know, he was obviously riding the Suzuki, which, you know, went through a very strange development phase of being a very ordinary motorcycle. Um, and then having, uh, it's actually quite a nice story to this actually, but Sylvain Gabors was obviously in charge of the Suzuki program, um, along with Suzuki Germany over here at the time. Um, and they took a, like an independent swing at their own development and managed to get the bike working really well, but it wasn't enough for Kenny because he had a few um, reliability issues. I think it was in 2010 and then jumped on the KTM and won the world championship. But, um, you know, I think we can all see that he was not destined to the world championship. And I can actually remember uh, it was the 2010 Motocross and Nations at Thunder Valley. Um, I think Roxon may have won his class on the day. He certainly won a, a moto, I seem to remember. And there was this story, uh, I think it might have even been DC, where, you know, Kenny had apparently said, I am desperate to come here. I'm desperate to race in the US. And it was kind of like this thing where you thought, ah, you know. It, we, we really want to see this kid, how far he can go and how good sure. he can become because, yep. uh, you know, he was mastering the sand, hard pack, whatever condition. Uh, he was faster in the development chain than Hurlings, who was still kind of a little bit immature at that time, even though they were both 15, 16 years old. Um, you know, he was the complete rider earlier. And, you know, you would have these grizzled veterans saying, oh, this track is so difficult to pass. It's really one line. And then Roxon would sit in a press conference and say well you know there's always a place to pass and that kind of uh, fresh take and attitude on it was was really refreshing you know so there was a bit of kind of sadness that he disappeared you know away from gps i mean he came back and i think he he raced um the mhgp class on a 350 if i remember at his home grand prix in germany uh, finished on the podium uh, that might have been 2012 or 13 but um you know, I mean, his story is fantastic. I mean, it's not a surprise to see him be the poster boy of, uh, of U.S. racing. Boom. Quick break from this awesome Adam Wheeler conversation to remind you to support our journalistic endeavors at RacerX, racerxonline.com, not just our website, but also the magazine. You can read every article and every single word and see every photo, everything in the magazine now through the website, but you do have to subscribe. So go to racerxonline.com slash subscribe. We're giving you Ethica motocross theme underwear i'm not going to model it but take my word for it they look cool ethica underwear with your subscription 30 bucks a year you'll get all 12 issues in the mail old school print style if you like that and you get access to read everything on the website which means you can yes read it all on your phone my phone's stuck around my desk i was going to demonstrate you can do that and you get exclusive stories that you wouldn't read for free on the website, including Davey's stories, all things and badly about the breakup of Kawasaki and Eli Tomac. That's exclusive in the issue. If you're a subscriber, you can read it on the website right now. RacerXOnline.com slash subscribe or RacerXOnline.com slash Weege, W-E-E-G-E. -E. Then I get credit for your subscription, not money-wise, just within the company, which is still cool because I can sell more subs than Mathis, which gives me bragging rights, which is priceless. Um, and the fact that he's going against Dylan is is kind of uh, unusual because they seem to miss each other. They miss each other by a couple of years. Mm -hmm. I mean, Ferrandis was uh, a very unique character, a bit of a loner, a bit of a nomad. Uh, you know, he he didn't seem to have many friends or buddies, you know, outside of a French clique. Um, I think it was 2016 where him and Hurlings were going for it. There, there were, he wasn't really quite at Jeffrey's level, but he he did his best to rattle him and put him off. And we're talking about swinging left and right out of the gate, purposely lining up next to him just to rattle hurlings. I mean, there was some real kind of um, dirty racing going on there for a while. I think there was one press conference in Germany, if memory fails me, where hurlings took the microphone and said, you know, these guys are trying to run me off the track. That's the only way they can beat me is to try and hurt me. Um, and it was, it was quite something to see, you know, Ferrandis just doing a, a deadpan face directly ahead, not reacting to any of this. 
Um, unfortunately, I think his season finished. The last time we saw him was a crash. Um, he crashed in the, in the Swiss GP. I think he broke his arm that day. And that was the last we saw of him in Europe. And of course, apart from the motocross of nations. But, you know, I think I don't want to rattle on too much, but I think um, everybody here is slightly surprised how good he's become at Supercross. I mean, he was always a very capable motocrosser. But to see the man he's won, it's really quite cool. Um, you know, and he's one of those great individual kind of characters in, in sort of the, the Vilman Porcel kind of, uh, you know, um, way. Uh, it's, uh, I, I really hope he can get it done just to kind of upset the apple cart a little bit more. Yeah, it has been fun to watch that. You can rattle on all you want because that was literally the, the number one reason I wanted to talk to you. And then we've got all these other things we've gotten into <laughs> was Brandis is now on the verge of being one of the best right now. Like he could be 450 motocross champ. Who knows? He could win a 450 supercross title. It's all in play now. I think everyone knew that Roxon was destined for greatness. And I think everybody knew that say Jeffrey Hurlings was destined for greatness in Europe. When in his formative years, which we didn't get to see, did everyone think, yeah, this could conceivably be the level he's going to get to, or is this actually surprising? I guess you've already said it on the supercross side. Did you think he had this level of talent? No. No, I thought he could be a guy that would fight for a world championship. Yeah. But um, he quite quickly made uh, his opinion known uh, for maybe, you know, uncompetitive machinery or, you know, for his uh, dislike of certain aspects of Grand Prix, you know, whether it's preparation of the tracks or whatever else. We just got so much better in, in MHGP in the last five years um, than it used to be. And it used to attract criticism, you know, and I think rightfully so. But, uh, you know, I, I don't think that that kind of um, spear can be thrown at the series anymore. But, yeah, Dylan, um, you know, especially adaptation to the 450, um, you know, it, it's been surprising to see. It's, like I say, it's been cool to see. And, I mean, I knew kind of um, a guy called Jeremy DeBeast, who was uh, Ferranis' manager initially in the, the last phases of his Grand Prix career. And he asked me if I could help write the, the, a letter of support or like a character reference for his visa application for the U.S., so I did it and I had to write, you know, that Dylan was a, you know, an outstanding elite athlete, blah, blah, blah. blah. He was on, he was on the path to, you know, a great achievement in the sport. So um, he obviously got his visa. So it must've been a, it must've helped out a little bit, but I apologize to all of his rivals now, if I tried to, you know, if I helped Dylan establish himself, but, you know, he had a really tough year, uh, you know, his first season um, was, was, was pretty gnarly to watch. And I think that was what we expected. Um, yeah. you know, and also the same, you could say for Kenny, he, he, he took time to adapt. Um, you know, Zach Osborne coming back from Europe as well needed to sort of, you know, it's obvious that you need to get, you need to hit the ground running. Of course, you don't have much time in, Mo. um, but you know, I think, yeah, I, to answer your question anymore, I don't know how Dylan is now as a character, but, uh, you know, when, when he was in Europe, we did kind of think he, he was a good rider, but not necessarily a fantastic, you know, a great one. Yeah, right. It's like you kind of see rivalries brewing. I'm sure in Europe it was like, oh, man, Hurlings and Roxon, someday they'll collide. We had it here. It's like someday James Stewart and Carmichael will collide. No one had the someday Roxon and Ferrandis will race each other. That wasn't like a puzzle piece that people were putting together, I wouldn't think. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, I, I wonder how much he's valued inside like kind of Yamaha as well. I mean, it's how he's been with five, right, five years now with Star or six years. Yeah, I mean, and... Um, it, I think it's changed rapidly because everyone on star on the YZ 250 F here has been amazing. So I think at one point it was just one of many guys, half a dozen guys who've been amazing on that bike, but now that he, and to a similar extent, Plessinger, now that they're really turning the 450 fortunes around, I think his value is uh, changing like literally weekly uh, because he's the first guy that's really getting it done, uh, making that transition. Yeah. And as far as his character here, just for your information, it is somewhat similar. Um, and I think one of the things that makes him so good and maybe why he's improved so much is he says over and over, he's like, I do not have friends. I do not have hobbies. I do nothing but race. I'm here with my wife. We don't have friends. We don't have a social life. When I have weekends off, I don't even know what to do. He harps on that. <laughs> and I don't think he's even probably even savvy enough speaking English to be saying that to like brand himself as some gnarly warrior. I think he's just telling the truth that he has no other thing in his life besides racing. All the guys ride hard and train hard and try hard, but it seems to me like he's got an extra four or five percent focus on I'm here for nothing but racing. And I thought maybe that was just because he's a Frenchman living in the U.S. 
And it sounds like maybe he's always had a little bit of that in him. I'm not here for friends. I'm just here to race and do my best. Yeah, I think that's very much the yeah. case. And like, you know, those, those athletes really split opinion, don't they? Some people think they're arrogant and they're boring and they're one dimensional. Yeah. And other people respect the fact that they're utterly, utterly committed to their craft. I mean, I, you know, I'm a fan of Christophe Porcel. And uh, in 2006, 2007, I was quite critical of him in print because, you know, the, I thought there was a, a lack of professionalism. I thought there was a truculence towards us and other people in the paddock, that, almost like a, a veil of disrespect, if you like. Um, you know, and I was, I was openly critical. But then, you know, as the years went on, I think you come to appreciate that the guy is his own person. Um, you know, he, he sees the world his way. He's not going to play any games. And, you know, he was absolutely brilliant at what he did. Um, and I don't think you can go for very long and not have an admiration for somebody like that. Um, and I see Dylan pretty much in the same way. Um, I mean, I know that just from talking to people like Gareth Swanepoel, you know, he said that, you know, Ferrandez, even when it came to training and, and um, routines and stuff like that, was, was pretty much going left when the rest of the team were going right. And you think, well, that's what he believes in. And the important thing for Ferrandis is that he made it work. I mean, if he was finishing 10th every week and he was already back in France, you could say, well, you went over there, you were how you are and you screwed it up. But he's managed to sort of, you know, take his character, his integrity and, you know, his, his approach to racing and maintain it and make a success of it. And for that, you know, I think he's, he's revered rightly as one of the best European riders in the US in, you know, in the last 15, 20 years. That is a great point that it can go in both directions, right? Because um, at one point, Porcel was clearly on the same exact plane as Villapoto and Dungey. And then we know over the next, say, five to seven years, Villapoto and Dungey were the best two guys. And it was like, well, at one point, Porcel was right there with him. Also, Jason Lawrence was. We all know what happened there. But with Porcel, <laughs> a lot of it was blamed on his personality. Like, there were teams didn't want to deal with him, and he didn't want to deal with teams. And Villapoto and Dungey did an excellent job of just completely marrying themselves to the teams that they were on forever and for always. They did an excellent job of even the weaknesses of their bike or their team. They, they owned that and they tried to help. Where Purcell, it worked against him. You know, it was always perceived that the minute, like he was never, he never fully embraced the teams he was on. That was always at least a perception. And then you can look back and be like, man, he could have been winning races like Villapoto and Dungey and he didn't. And his personality got in the way. True or untrue, that's the rep. Ferrandis didn't quite obviously go to that level. He's, if anything, he's exceeded. And I have heard, yes, he is harsh on his team. When the bike isn't right, he's, he's harsh. But isn't it funny how just based on results, almost the exact same attitude can be perceived as, hey, what's your problem? Or, hey, man, he's just doing what it takes to win. That's amazing how much can yeah. break like that. <laughs> <laughs> I remember having a, a nice talk with Bobby Hewitt actually because he persevered with Porcel, you know, with the yes. factory Husqvarna equipment. But you know, I mean, if you spend any time, even like five minutes with Bobby Hewitt and just look him in the eyes, you can see there's a there's a man who's passionate about stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, almost to a, a point of intimidation. Yep. Um, and I think you know he he just he he relished the challenge that Christoph and his character presented to him and. Um, you know, it's uh, it was was a good fit for both people at the time. And I think, you know, you, that must be one of the interesting facets of running a team is that if you want the good guys, some, sometimes you're dealing with complicated individuals. I mean, it's not a case of a kid just coming in saying, I want to be the best. I'll do whatever you tell me to do. You know, they're going to have their own opinion at some point. I mean, the fallacy of motor racing is that we are often dealing or talking as journalists to kids, um, people that are, yeah. you know, immature, underdeveloped, um, sheltered. You know, they um, they don't have a perspective on the world. I mean, you can answer, you could even say that James Stewart is somebody who had a very, very unique upbringing experience on life. Um, right. You know, when you talk to him, you have that kind of uh, that and that impression. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like somebody like Christoph and, and to a degree, Dylan, I think he was a little bit more flexible than, than Christoph uh, or is rather. Um, you know, the, you, that you really feel that. And while it's frustrating and you think, you know, it's kind of hard to comprehend sometimes because you think, you know, you're pulling in a salary that's, you know, so much more than, you know, the people sit in the stadium watching you. You're doing a, a job that you dream of, all the rest of the cliches. But, um, you know, why are you not just towing the line a little bit more or, or just doing this or doing that to, to you know, earn a better payday or make the most of it while the sun is shining? I mean, in Grand Prix, we had people like Clement de Sauer who are very much the same, very individualistic, 
you know, will go their own way, sometimes will be, you know, anti-establishment to the point of self-harm in terms of their image, their profile or their earning power or whatever. Um, but, you know, if, if we didn't have these guys, I mean, you could even argue in Supercross that, you know, you've been missing a few of these things. I mean, some of the behind the scenes video footage of Eli Tomac and Bastia are pulling up the track and having a little bit of a, you know, chat about it for an international audience of people that don't, you know, live the sport. I mean, that's gold dust. And that's the reason why F1 succeeded on Netflix is because they were presenting a very dramatic narrative of the sport that was more than just the results, the technology and the cars. Um, you know, so it's, uh, you know, we need these guys. There's a yeah, long way know, of talking of, uh, of going around it. It honestly goes back to that thing I was saying where almost sometimes controversial calls, although they're not good, it does get people talking. Right. I always said like uh, Tomac is not this outgoing, amazing personality on the microphone. Right. But there's a subset of people that are, hey, I like that. He just works. He shows up. He does his job. He doesn't brag. If you want the more flamboyant guy. Well, then you're a Roxon guy or something like that. Yeah, you need to have all kinds. And I do think now that Fernandez is having this level of success, I think it's going to be harder for fans. I mean, the fans hated him two years ago. I think it's going to be harder for people to feel that way because you have to respect the dude is just a grinder. And isn't that really what the fans want out of their athletes? He's giving you 101% every weekend. So I think they're coming around on this guy. Not like he cares. I think they need yeah, fans ultimately. <laughs> yeah, not like he cares. And fans yeah. ultimately need somebody they can relate to. You know, I think they like, that's why, you, you know, it's a, such a simplistic story of casting one guy is the bad guy and one guy is the guy you want to win. I mean, if you want to, if you're, if you're the biggest Dunge fan ever, then that's for a reason. You know, the guy who not only was a machine, but he was um, um, professionalism and uh, niceness personified. Right. Um, but, you know, uh, you know, if you if you have a dunge who's like super popular, then you're going to need a Ferrandis that's not going to talk to you. Maybe he's not going to sign an autograph. He's just going to go straight to practice because that's there. That's what he's paid to do and what he wants to do. Yeah. Um, but it's it's, it's, it's I mean, maybe we're to blame as well. You know, maybe, you know, by me criticizing Porcel, I was informing someone's opinion that he was a, a bad guy, um, you know, and it's the same. You know, we we uh, but, you know, that's fun of that's the fun of sports reporting and journalism, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, we're always out to try to make it as enjoyable for the fans in general and not any individual rider. Mathis definitely went through that with Porcel because I remember Mathis <laughs> would go to a GP every year and they'd be like, what's Porcel like? And then they would start telling him old Porcel stories and he's like, wait, this is how you feel about this guy? And then he kept digging deeper and getting more information. I'm not even saying that Ferrandis is like that at all. I'm, I'm, he's hard on his team, but even they respect it from a, hey, he just wants to win. He's not a jerk standpoint. On Roxon. Okay, I want to ask you about this. So, Roxon, he's been here almost 10 years now, so I have a lot of data. He is amazing in the first couple laps of a race. He's as good as anyone except for maybe Stewart or maybe the same on nailing a track in the very first lap. He needs no warm-up. He nails every section. His best lap is his first lap. And also, the first rounds of a series are his best. And then it tends to go the other direction. I say, hey, that's for physics, right? The Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. You can't be the world's best sprinter and the world's best marathoner. You're going to have one or the other. Uh, that's what I see now. Was Roxanne kind of always like that? Amazing at the beginning of a race, amazing at the beginning of a season, and then not as good at the end? Because that's what we've seen for a long time with him. I don't know if this is going to last, these first three good rounds. No, I mean, from the two and a half years he was racing in Europe, I mean, from round five of 2009, when he made his debut, 2010, when he had that kind of troublesome, you know, uh, fight with Marv, ironically, for, for the MX2 title, but the Suzuki was uh, coughing a few times. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, his title campaign in 2011. <clears throat> I remember thinking, here's a young guy without much, much weakness. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there was, there was no fitness issues. Uh, there was no confidence issues in terms of mentality. He he seemed like a lion. Um, you know, there was no no hang-ups, I guess. Uh, so, I, you know, it's like you say, you have a lot of data from that, that 10 years in the US, 2012 was his, was his first season there. Um, you know, the injury, the injuries have been, su and the illnesses have been super well documented. Um, I don't know. I mean, like you say, I put him on in terms of natural talent. I put him on a on a plate, you know, along with people like Mark Marquez in MotoGP, um, who is the de facto road racer when it comes to um, visualizing the changing conditions. That's why when it starts to rain or the conditions start to change on a, on a MotoGP race, then Marquez is your guy 
I mean, yeah. even with like a you know a half functioning you know um, right shoulder, the guy is, is 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 phenomenal in terms of being able to feel the grip and the motorcycle. I put Roxon in the same bracket, mm -hmm. um, and it's a little puzzling why he's not able to carry that speed towards the end of a main. Uh, maybe it is you know if the track is changing and chopping and really roughing up, then you think he would have that power of adaptation to to really you know carry the same speed throughout. Or maybe it's just the fact which that you know somebody like Cooper Webb is able to do it to a higher degree and with more aggression. Um, maybe he's prepared to to push the boat out a bit more. Um, I can't help but feel that the Roxon from 2000 and you know 13, 14, 15 would would have won a, a Supercross championship by now. Well, that's why I asked the question, right? Because if it's like he was always like this to a degree, that's one thing. <clears throat> but you're kind of seeing more of after the injuries, after things he's been through. That's when this change started to happen. Uh, I, I just feel bad because I feel like there's nothing worse, right, than leading a race and then getting passed at the end. That is not a badge of honor. That is, you either need to get in better shape or you need to be more of a warrior when it, when it counts in the final moments. You're always going to get hung when you get passed late in the race. And he got posterized, as they would say, by Webb, especially this year. And I'm like, man, I think it's, I think it's more than that. I don't think it's just Ken doesn't want it enough or Ken's chokes. Uh, I think there's something even physical to it. Um, and maybe it is now just the injuries. Actually, here's the other thing. The riders will tell you when those tracks are beat up at the end of the day, they are just sketchy. And maybe when mm. you've been through the injuries, he's just like, I'm not going to go through the whoops and just throw caution to the wind and whatever happens, happens. I'm going to try to ride in a controlled fashion. And when those tracks are gnarly, those super cross tracks with holes on the faces of jumps or ruts, maybe he's just less willing to risk it. The other thing guys. is as well, maybe, yeah. maybe, you know, he needs to try a different strategy and think, right, I'm going to try and go with Cooper. I'm going to try and go with Eli and rather not, you yeah. know, the lead from the front, you know, put himself more into the, into the role of being the hunter. But maybe there is a fear that, you know, he won't be able to run that pace for, for 20 minutes. And it's a case of like, right, okay, I'm going to have to try and get away from these guys. Um, you know, I mean, pretty much like we're seeing Fabio Quattararo doing MotoGP at the moment. I mean, once he gets to the front, he goes. Uh, it's just, you know, it's a, an age old racing strategy. And I think that's, that's Ken's um, biggest plan A, you know, he seems to struggle if he, you know, with a plan B. Yeah. I think it's just, you got to play to your strengths. Tomac is never going to be an unbelievable starter. He's never going to burn the field in the first three laps. Ferrandis is the same way. He's a really a terrible starter. He's never good in the first couple laps. He's amazing at the end. Roxon is just the opposite. And I think that they just are who they are. I don't think it's as much like if Roxon would just train harder, or uh, be more mentally tough. I'm like, nah, he's just built for the first five laps of a race and Tomac's built for the last five. And that's just like almost their physical being right now. I don't know if you can just flip that. Um, go ahead. You got more on that? Wait, does he actually, is he, has he won, has he won anything since he left Olden? Uh, yeah, uh, that is, he does have that. 2016, he won the 450 motocross championship post Alden, and he rubbed the nose in it, rubbed the face in it every week. I remember um, <laughs> by like the third round, we knew he was going to win the title. He was so much better than everybody else. It was Stewart and Carmichael have had perfect seasons. So Roxon's 2016 is never going to be considered on that level. I think he won 20 out of 24 motos, and it was a joke. It was three laps into every moto, he was gone. And I remember interviewing him early, even early in the season, and I'm like, he's going to win the title. I'm like, uh, what are you into, man? And he's like, I like two things. I like winning races and I like eating food. And I'm like, ah, uh, I think we're all picking up what <laughs> you're you lay laying down. Let me eat food that I want to eat and I will win races. Got it. Uh, so he did have post Alden success. Um, I don't think we ever thought that we now hold 2016 pre Honda Roxon, pre injury Roxon as like peak Roxon. It seemed like the best was yet to come. And now it's, yeah, that ended up being his best. Yep. We were kind of hearing stories back in Europe how um, he, you know, would like delay going back to boot camp like an extra day because he wanted to eat some food. Uh, or, you know, he couldn't hold down like a, a training regime where, you know, coming in from a moto, he'd be given like eight almonds or something to eat. Um, you know, it yep. was, uh, you know, he, he couldn't quite handle that. Um, but, you know, you got to respect him because obviously he, he worked with Alden intimately and picked up knowledge from him and then applied to his own regime. So it's uh, and he's still arguably the premium athlete in, in, in Supercross. So he's doing something right. Yeah, that's kind of my point. I, I know that he gets passed late in races by Webb, but I don't want to just be say, 
he just needs to train harder or he needs to be more fit. I, I don't think that's that uh, simple. So let me go to, uh, yeah, MotoGP here, which I don't know. Some people listen to the podcast could not possibly care less. I'm all into it now. I'm feeling a little bit better now. So I did one time write a blog for On Track Off Road. So I started watching MotoGP hardcore last year. Mark Marquez, the dominant figure, goes out, injured at the first round. Fabio Quartararo, who was on the rise, starts winning immediately. And I'm like, oh, this is simple. This is simple. Marquez was the best. Now he's hurt. Quartararo is going to win everything. And then someday they'll tangle again. Well, that didn't work out at all for Quartararo last year. And I'm like, <laughs> I didn't see this Suzuki John Mir thing coming at all. I felt dumb. Now it looks like that narrative is starting to finally happen again. It's like Quadro needed one more year of seasoning. To me, he looks like he's managing races. He still has weird things happen, but he's managing most races better, I feel, than last year. So are we now starting to see him maybe become the guy, or is it too early to say that? No, I think you're, you're on the money. I mean, okay. I think from he's won four of nine rounds so far this year, and there's always a, like a – like an air of drama around Quadraro. Just look at this year. I mean, he was winning oh. in Spain. Um, he had he had an arm pump issue and drifted mm-hmm. all the way back to 13th, which at the time you're watching and you think, well, he's either got a technical problem with the bike or he has a physical problem or either it's the biggest choke you've ever seen in Grand Prix yeah. racing. Yeah. Um, so he has an arm pump operation, which I think may be the second or the third that he's had. Um, and then, you know, we, when the championship goes back to Spain in Catalonia, you know, he has this bizarre issue where he's being like choked almost by his chest protector and yeah. just, you know, like in moto, um, I think it's the same in AMA in the MHDP chest protection is compulsory. Okay. It's obligatory. Um, yeah. you know, it's, it's the same in MotoGP, in but the guys, it's not. really? It's no, not? you can do whatever you want. Run a Jersey if you want, go ahead. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, I think there's, you know, I'm not sure if they do it anymore, but a couple of years ago, there used to be an FIM guy at the end of the gate, you know, tapping the the chest and the, and the back of each rider, wow. you know, just to check there was some chest protection on there. Maybe, you know, it was in the European classes at least, but anyway, so, you know, MotoGP is obligatory as well, but usually it's just kind of like this strange disc shape and they just like, they shove it in their leathers and zip it up just before they, you know, go to the grid. And so he was being, you know, kind of this chest protection was rising up. So he had to zip his leathers and chuck it. But then, of course, he's riding around for two laps with leathers unzipped because he can't, you know, he didn't slow down basically to, to zip them back up. Yeah. And you have these fantastic images now of like Quattro looking like some guy from the 70s who's just, you know, bombing oh, yeah. around something like, I don't know, uh, Laguna Seca or whatever. You know, it's just, uh, some some grand national hero. Just, uh, you know, he needed to have a cigarette just out of his helmet. just to Yeah, he the had look. the unzipped leather jacket. It's what it looked like. Bare chested, unzipped, racing his motorcycle. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, with a six pack showing off, and Fabio yeah. likes a little bit of his bizarre fashion anyway. I mean, he's talking mm-hmm. about a guy in his early twenties. So, from the arm pump issue to the leathers issue, um, you know, these have been sort of minor points of kind of meltdown where you think, well, to somebody who isn't, isn't really focused, that can throw a championship thing to the kilter, you know, or off kilter. But uh, you know, aside from that, he's had the, the the raw speed. He's been in the factory team, of course. Um, last week in Assen in the Netherlands, you know, the most most historic circuit in MotoGP. Um, Yamaha are sort of mired in more controversy because their second rider, Mary Pinales, has now ended you know, a two year contract early. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, on one side of the garage, everything is kind of going swimmingly because Quasarara won. But on the other side, um, you know, one of the most talented riders in, in MotoGP is, is going to be heading somewhere else. Um, he's clearly dissatisfied. Pinales won the first Grand Prix of the year in Qatar, but since then, it's just he's just tumbled down the order. Um, you know, he actually finished last in two races ago in Germany. So Yamaha, as usual, having their fair share of drama, but Quattararo is, um, you know, he's he's got the momentum going. And in contrast, Suzuki was the, the best. I um, mean, racing's about compromise, right? So uh, he, that, that motorcycle was the, the bike that can cope with the tires, the conditions, and everything else in the best way possible in 2020. But that package hasn't quite been quick enough um, or competitive enough this season. I mean, the Ducati seems to be pretty much the, the bike to have apart from Quattro and the Yamaha. But then, I'm sorry again to rattle on, but if you have four Yamahas on the grid like you do, Vinales has had his own issues. Valentino Rossi is to the point now where he hasn't scored a top 10 result and the end is looking nigh. Uh, Franco Morbidelli looked competitive, but you know has wrecked his left knee. He actually missed the last round in Holland. So you cannot say the Yamaha is the best bike to have because you have such a disparate you know, range of form, speed and results. 
um, the Ducatis, there's more Ducatis on, on, the, on the grid than any other motorcycle. Um, and they have a spread of like someone experienced like Joanne Sarko all the way down to the rookies like Luca Marini and Aya Bastianini. So there's, um, there's a real kind of spread there of, of potential. Um, so, and then the Honda continues to be a nightmare for somebody like Marquez, uh, you know, I mean, he's superhuman, so they're naturally creating a motorcycle just for him. Um, but the rest of the guys, Taka Nakagami, Alex Marquez and Paul Spargaro, um, are just finding it very, very hard to be competitive on that bike. So, uh, if, if Guattararo can fin finish the deal, uh, he's looking in a very good place, but otherwise I would look out for people like Jack Miller and uh, Paco Bagnaia on the official Ducatis to, to come strong, especially as we get to some of the faster tracks like Red Bull Ring. Yeah, I feel like Quattararo, when he doesn't have issues, okay, he got, I think, fifth at the opener. Opening round is always a little weird. He had a, one race he was in the rain, he didn't win. He had one race where he had the arm pump, he didn't win. He had one race where his chest protector had to come out, he didn't win. Almost every other race, he's been the best guy. It's almost like if you take rain, weird opener, and weird issues out, he's been the best guy on balance. But at the same time, you're like, oh, but this guy's always like one minute away from something ridiculous happening. So maybe he doesn't hold on. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it. That's, 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 that's all. Yeah, absolutely. And he's very unpredictable. So yeah. it's uh, <clears throat> one thing. I mean, he's, he's, he's the man over one lap. I mean, he's going to be he's easily going to have the most pole positions or whatever, you know, at the end of the season. But, um, you know, making that pa package competitive throughout the range of tracks still to come that's going to be the big question mark. And then you have to watch out for people like the KTMs who, you know, had a nightmare in the first two races of the double header in Qatar, but then, you know, made small uh, chassis modifications and then looking pretty strong. Um, that, you know, Miguel Oliveira, you, you know, he's another guy pretty much in the Ferrandis mold of being very much his own character. Um, he has no problems whatsoever in showing derision for the most banal of journalistic uh, questions. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think you should join one of the debriefs one time with him, which I think you'd have a bit of fun. Um, okay. uh, yeah, so, you know, he, he still has a big, uh, say in this championship. Yeah, I believe. Oh yeah. Let me ask one more thing in this KTM side. So KTM, obviously in MXGP, it's ridiculous how good they have been. Yes. Geyser might be the best guy and, and has won the title the last couple of years on Hondas, but their record in MXGP is unbelievable. They make inroads in the United States. No one can even believe that they've become as good as they were. They used to be a laughing stock. That's narrative is long gone. Um, the last, every other thing, you know, you named a car, any type of off-road racing, they're just like, whatever we get into, we're going to own it. I know that they were kind of laughed at at MX, in a MotoGP, like, you're not going to be able to do this here, certainly not as quickly as you say, and then they did that. To me, when they started winning last year, ahead of their own expectations even, I almost thought it was a scary moment, because I do hear people sometimes say, hey, you guys are all telling this story of how amazing the KTM group is. If they get too dominant and the other manufacturers give up, you're going to wish that those manufacturers didn't leave. So I almost got worried. I'm like, dude, is the complete world takeover complete? So at least KTM's <laughs> got slowed a little bit. Was there any worry when KTM kind of conquered MotoGP briefly with some wins last year that people were like, oh, man, this was the last thing the Japanese or Ducati could hold down and they can't even hold that for it anymore? Um, yes because I think people are very surprised that KTM would be that competitive that quickly. I mean, yes. I still remember being at Red Bull Ring in 2016 in Austria when Stefan Piero, the CEO of the yeah. group, you know, the Piero group, that sort of, yeah. you know, this um, house of brands, um, you know, he kind of sat there and said on the mic, on the record, you know, we're going to be winning in this championship within five years. Um, and, you know, you could see all the old hacks and the old hands kind of scoffing at this claim, thinking, mm -hmm. right, okay, there's some typical misplaced Germanic Austrian, you know, arrogance there. Mm -hmm. um, but look, I mean, the guys ended up, you know, being right. And there's three reasons for that. One is that when they decide to go for it, they go for it. I mean, I'm talking about yeah. budget, I'm talking about expertise, and I'm talking about support. Um, you know, if they invest in something and they, they, they believe in the vision of it, then they'll go, they'll run with it. They won't just yeah. like think, well, that hasn't worked after two years, we're going to pin it. Um, the second thing is you cannot underestimate the role that Pip Byrus had uh, in terms of his management style. He's very much been a believer of appointing the right people in the right positions. And I think you can see that from the, through the, the Costa and the Dungy appointment, you know, in 2011. Um, I mean, that basically reversed what was a, a laughing stock of uh, KTM's factory effort um, in the US up until that point. And um, it's been the same in MSGP for a number of years since they turned things around, you know, in the mid 
uh, noughties. I mean, you had Sebastian Tortelli riding a 450 that was based on a, a Dura bike chassis. I mean, it was a yeah. complete failure. Um, yeah. But since they, you know, decided to, you know, build a new concept and then, you know, ventured into the 350 high Cairoli, um, they've become the dominant force in MXGP, especially in MX2. And then, you know, the same thing with, with MotoGP. You know, they hired the right technicians, the right people. <clears throat> when he became available, Danny Pedrosa was hired as a test rider and his feedback from like 20 years of Honda has been invaluable. And uh, now um, KTM, apart from just results in road racing, have um, the envy of everybody else from this talent kind of filter they have from feeder series all the way through the classes, Moto2, Moto3, MotoGP. So it's quite something to see. Yeah, and that's my point. That is awesome and good for them. It's a great story. People like you and I can tell it over and over. You know, you tell that Stefan Pierre story, that sounds amazing. You know, the when we heard that Roger DeCosta was going to KTM, it was like, we'll retell that story over and over because it was like, how could this work? And then it did. Same thing with Dungey. But then I hear people say, be careful. Do you want to eventually have KTM, Husqvarna, and Gas Gas as the only brands that are even racing? And might I add, we're already kind of seeing it. Suzuki... Is no longer even close to what they were. In MotoGP, they still have it, maybe even better than they have been for a while, but they are out of MXGP. They are almost out of the motocross game altogether. And I keep hearing people say, well, hopefully Suzuki can someday get back. And I'm like, how are they going to? A huge piece of the pie is now owned by KTM that didn't used to be there. So you're already starting to see that's one long term, long standing legacy brand that's almost being shoved aside because of this amazing success that KTM has had. So I was almost scared. I'm like, man, if they get MotoGP dialed and every other racing series, how long until other manufacturers are like, we give up? So that's what's scary sometimes. Yeah, I can, I can remember in the heat of the kind of battles between Ustream, the old in-front motor racing and MHGP and the manufacturers, you know, um, Ustream were the point was saying, well, we'll just have a series of KTMs. You know, if they're, right. they're the only brand that want to go with us and support our vision, you know, everybody want a KTM and we'll race with these guys. You know, we don't need to have all the brands. If they want to go away and run their own Spinter series, you know, without FIM branding, which would scare the Japanese, um, yeah. fine, I'm going to let them. I mean, I remember doing interviews, you know, with, with upper management and being quite worried about, about this stuff. So it's, you know, it's not beyond the realms of possibility, which is even is even more scary. Um, yeah. But yeah, you know, KTM have these three <laughs> three brands now. Excuse me. <clears throat> and um, yeah, they're maximizing their their racing effort. Yeah. But uh, you know, when it comes to Suzuki, I can't help but feel that they're going to come back when you know with some kind of electric or hybrid technology. Oh, okay. uh, you know, that's that's the next time we're going to see a Suzuki dirt bike in the gate. I think that'll be. This, they, apparently they still produce like RMZs, uh, like you know, 250s and 450s. Yeah, they do make. Um, but you know, yeah. I think you know the the yeah, the next barrier has to be electric power. And if Suzuki uh, maybe one of the first Japanese, which you know would, but I mean, let's not forget, I think they were the first brand to have fuel injection. Um, you know, in 2003, yeah, 2004, yep. on the 450s. Yep. So, uh, you know, perhaps if they're pioneers of an electric or hybrid technology for dirt bikes, then, um, you know, they could come back with some sort of force. Yeah, they always have historically been the most high and low. Uh, they have amazing times and they have terrible times and very little in between. So maybe there's another rise. You know, Suzuki even invented the four wheel ATV. They even invented that. So it's like, I think with like the three wheelers were the big thing way back in the day. It was like, why is Suzuki so terrible at this? And it was like two years later, it's like, cause we're working on something no one had even thought of that's going to be even better. So maybe they got one more trick up their sleeve. I, I think people want that. I don't think people want to see uh, oh, one's off to the side. Who's next. And eventually we just have KTM Husky and Gas yes. <laughs> racing each other. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, it's been actually this even been more enlightening than I even thought. I wouldn't even think about the FIM thing. We had scheduled this a few days before that news popped up on Supercross yesterday. Yeah. So good timing. Yep. Yeah, cool. absolutely. I want to see uh, if Supercross does look a bit different in the next couple of years. I don't think it will, but, you know, it's, um, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, I don't think, if everybody's excited for like, oh, what changes it's going to make, I still think it's more of the, the huge change, the huge expansion. We're actually going in a different direction, which is just keep what we have going. I think if I were to guess that's the pandemic has scared people right now and they're just trying to get back to what worked and let's make it look like 2019. How about that? 
I think that might be yeah. all it's in store right now. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right. On track. Hey, off road. Um, check it out. Yep. I've got one question for you. Is there going to be a yep. monster cup this year or not? I do not think I have heard nothing about it. I don't think it's going to happen. Um, but I don't think it's dead uh, forever. I've heard some rumors of how that could eventually be used uh, maybe in a different format or a different time of year. Um, but no, I don't think it's happening. Somebody just hit me up on Twitter like right now. So I might be wrong. No, it was just Denny Stevenson saying, since there's no Monster Energy Cup, maybe we can have all the Americans race to nations again. <laughs> That's not an official. I hope so. Of course. Yeah, I was well, just a quickly that. before we go and the nations. Yeah, yeah the nations is, is going to be really yes. uncharted territory. I mean, if you if someone like Tim Geiger has a 20 point lead in the championship and there's, I think, only four or five rounds to go after after that September date, you know, HRC really going to, you know, push all the push the boat out to have him race in there. I, I can't see it that much. Um, yeah, I was wondering that, uh, too. So way back. There, there were times where donations took place before the season ended, or is that never the case? It did AMA calendar at times. It happened during the season. Did that ever happen in the GPs? No, I think it's always been, for as long as I've known, it's always been at the end of the season. Ooh. So they've never had to wrestle with this conundrum before. Yeah. Uh, and I would love Let's... to say, what's the risk? But, we, dude, we've seen guys get hurt in donations a lot. <laughs> It happens. Yeah. And the thing is, it, but you cannot, it's the biggest event of the year, both for the industry and for the sport. It's a big cash cow. Um, so yep. you cannot, um, if you're having a world championship that's running until late October or the beginning of November, then you cannot just, uh, you know, cancel this thing. Um, it's going to take place in Mantova, which is a kind of a shallow, sandy track that gets very rough, but it's also like a very kind of small stadium set venue. I mean, you're not yeah. going to get 30,000 people into this place. Oh. Um, you know, which, you know, in the current times, you're not going to, you know, be worrying about too much anyway. This is not going to be a, a Madley Basin or a French Quarter or a Thunder Valley where you've got, you know, 40 to 50,000 people. Um, but, you know, I just, I wonder about the participation level. I just hope it still gets a good turnout. Yeah, the AMA calendar has moved back. So technically they don't have this five-week gap to deal with anymore, which historically the riders and teams here used as one of their reasons. They... Wheeler, they come up with a different reason every year for why they don't want to race the nations. Um, so whatever the reason is, you can solve it and they'll find another one. But um, it goes back to what we're saying. It probably didn't need to be in a place that could fit a lot of fans when they were planning it six or nine months ago. I don't know what Europe situation will be like in September. Maybe they'll wish they could fit 100,000 people. Yeah, fingers crossed, fingers crossed. But, uh, you know, I, at the very least, it's a very presentable venue. I mean, it's kind of easy to get to. Um, okay. You know, it'll look fantastic kind of on TV and stuff. Uh, and maybe it's just for these times, it's a, a pint-sized or a compact-sized version of the nations, which is what we need. One thing that helps the American effort is Bobby Regan, who is almost single-handedly, <laughs> he's like the only one that can successfully fight off KTM. He's like single-handedly through star racing on the verge of dominating the sport, winning both classes right now. He's all in on donations. I have found that the private style teams, when we had JGR with Barsha, Coy Gibbs is like, whatever check I got to write, Barsha's in. Regan has spent, I've heard 20, 30 grand out of his own pocket to, to when Ferrandis was racing it or Justin Cooper, Cooper Webb, Jeremy Martin, Alex Martin. The, those private teams, for whatever reason, they seem, I guess they just want to write the check. They don't need to answer to anybody. That might help. The more star yeah. racing success that there is, the more chance that there's riders that will be on a team that wants to compete. Maybe that'll help. <laughs> but also, you know, if you're really into it, there's other ways of doing it than just having a big sugar daddy. I mean, if you look at <clears throat> like Team Switzerland, I mean, they have like GoFundMe projects. I mean, they'll have like yeah. a, a fan interaction package. They'll sell stuff off places on the bike or whatever, just to generate the money to be able to send the riders and the mechanics and the trucks or whatever to the other side of Europe. So, you know, you just have to be a bit inventive and think, well, you know, I mean, like uh, Steve Mathis always likes to bang the drum that the U.S. are the, you know, the box office draw. Yeah. And uh, that was certainly, he is 100% on the money, like, you know, maybe 10 years ago even. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's a different prospect now. People still like to come and see, you know, Tomac and Basia or whoever, you know, Anderson representing the team. But um, there's also, you know, if you look at the fans and, and the kind of, uh, the, the demographic of them you know there's a lot of international fans there's a whole load of slovenians who come for geyser there's a whole load of mm. belgians that are going to come and support belgians the dutch 
Um, you know, it's not just people coming to say, oh, I want to go and see, you know, Carmichael or whatever. So, um, you know, Steve, Steve's partially right these days where, he, you know, he was totally on the money before. But uh, yeah, well, no, fingers crossed well the nations truth. can be revived. We, we, we might as well say the say truth. It. it was different in 15 years ago when everyone knew that Carmichael and Stewart were the best riders in the world. And you were only going to get yeah. to see them race in Europe one time. You can't make that argument anymore. No one could say if Tomac or, uh, wait, it can't be Roxanne or Ferrandis, they're not even American. If, if, if <laughs> Sexton, Tomac, Cooper, Webb, some combination of that were on the team, you can't say these are unquestionably the best riders in the world and I'm only going to get to see them in person one time a year. So I think that right along there has already kind of squashed not all the hype, like you're saying, but it can't be as much hype for Team USA as there was when they were winning every year. Sad, but yeah, true. Yeah, I mean, Team USA. I mean, I always, I always remember like Ricky Carmichael humbling Stefan Evans at the 03 Nations in wet Belgian sand. And I thought, yeah. you know, well, if that's, that's, that's an indication of how much good, how much better he is. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I just don't think that's the case anymore. And I think riders in the US, somebody like Cooper Webb, you know, would see the nations as a challenge. It's like, OK, I know I'm going over. I'm one of the best in the world, but maybe uh, am I better than Tim Geiger? You know, can I can I be faster than Hurlings on one day? Let me, let's have a look. Whereas I think before those guys, you know, Carmichael thought, give me a bike, I'll race. I know I'm going to win. Yeah. Yeah, it is a challenge. And uh, that's funny. I was just thinking about this the other day. Remember, there was actually like a Cooper Webb, Roman Fevra, like friendly duel rivalry like that yeah that feels like it was 20 years ago that's so weird that was a yeah that was glenn helen as well i mean february when yeah. he won i mean he was he was on fire at the end of 2015 i mean right uh, and then i, I remember him passing red down the bottom of one of the hills yeah yeah and it was like they hit a hooked up there they hooked up at the nations i think even like even Percy or australia like they were randomly running into each other and it was like wow these are two guys on the rise webb and february will probably be battling for the next 10 years and uh they probably haven't raced each other since so weird <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah uh well, well d you shouldn't even open the pandora's box we're gonna have to do a whole other podcast about the nations see look what you've done yeah oh absolutely yeah mm -hmm. i know we'll get there as it gets closer we'll have to do it all right this has been great so we'll definitely do it again thanks man cheers wage good to speak all to right. you